At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Welcome to the first recording, probably won't be the first broadcast in the 2022 new year, but it's a great pleasure to be back in the saddle, so to speak, after Christmas. And with me today is someone who really does need no introduction to those of you who are interested in drugs and drug policy. It's Ethan Nadelman, the man who really has put drug policy right in the front of the public debate in the USA and globally. And he and I have been on platforms all around the world. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, picking up the remains of what he hasn't told people. You know, just a few a few crumbs fall in my, fall in my lap after he's sorted everything out. But he truly is a, a remarkable man who's done probably more than anyone else to liberate a sensible discussion about drugs, particularly in America, which is one of the more challenging places to do that. So welcome, Ethan. Well, thank you, Dave. I mean, Dave, look, it's an honor to be on your podcast because you talk about the heroes in this field. I mean, your amount, your productivity, your brilliance, you're coming so frequently down on what seems to me just instinctively the right side of these issues. So it's a real honor to be on this show with you. And I look forward to having you on my podcast, Psychoactive, as well. That's the deal. There's no doubt about that. Yes. So, Ethan, well, a lot of people will heard of you, but they won't know quite as much as I do about your your story and, and how you got into this in the first place. And it, it is a wonderful tale. So do you want to just share that with people, how you suddenly discovered that your goal was to save the world from damn stupid drug policies? Yeah, sure, David. I mean, I mean, I guess for me, you know, just so people should know, you know, I was born in New York City and I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up in a fairly traditional Jewish family. My dad was a rabbi and not an Orthodox one, but my mom came from that sort of background. And I went off to college at McGill in Montreal. And that's when I first started smoking cannabis. Actually, it was hash, not, not marijuana, which was common back then in the mid 70s. And that was first got me wondering, like, why are people getting busted for this, you know, at the border or in Montreal? And, you know, alcohol is so much more a problem, but we wouldn't think of criminalizing that. So that sort of thought basically stuck with me. And I did the normal thing of experimenting with other drugs and doing some mushrooms and trying some other things. And then I was in graduate school in the early 80s and burning out on studying uh, U.S. foreign policy and Middle East politics, which had been my focus in my first publications. And, uh, you know, a friend was saying to me, Ethan, you've always been interested in the deviant side of things and you're, you're into drugs. Why don't you do something about that? So I recruited a few advisors at Harvard where I was doing a law degree and a PhD in political science. And I started embarking on the study of drugs and drug policy. And one of my advisors, Phil Hyman, a professor in the law school who had been high up in the Justice Department, he said, Ethan, instead of your idea of doing kind of a diplomatic history of U.S. drug control policy, why don't you focus on the intersection of criminal justice and foreign policy? or from a more academic perspective, the, inter the intersection of criminology and international relations. And so I did that. And that involved basically going down to DC. Uh, I got myself a security clearance and I actually worked in the State Department's Narcotics Bureau for a year in the mid eighties. I wrote a classified report on dealing with drug related money laundering. I traveled all around South America, Europe to 19 countries interviewing drug enforcement agents, DEA, local drug enforcement, customs, FBI, CIA, you name it. And I landed up writing a dissertation and a book called Cops Across Borders about the internationalization of U.S. criminal law enforcement. And all along, I knew the drug war was bullshit. But at the same time, I felt an intellectual obligation, a personal obligation to really write about what were the challenges that governments and especially law enforcement, law enforcement agents faced as they internationalized their efforts. So I had a chapter on how the DEA dealt with corruption in Latin America, how the DEA dealt with foreign law enforcement systems in Europe, all that sort of stuff. 
So I finished this in 87. And at that point, I finished the dissertation, started teaching at Princeton. At that point, the drug war is just going absolutely crazy in America. And we are exporting it around the world. And, and you know, I, I've described it as sort of McCarthyism on steroids. I mean, utter madness. I already knew from having worked in the government that the people were charged with enforcing these laws and on the diplomatic side knew nothing about the origins of the laws. They knew nothing. They had never thought about the policy consequences of these things. They were just kind of blindly pursuing this kind of massively punitive, you know, criminal type justice policy. And so I wrote an article in um, Foreign Policy Magazine, a very prestigious publication in the spring of 88, saying this is ridiculous. And most of what we identify as the drug problem are in fact not the results of drug misuse, but the results of a failed prohibitionist policy. And that doesn't mean we should legalize everything, but it does mean we need to understand that the objective needs to be mi to minimize not just the harms of drugs, but the harms of these failed prohibitionist policies as well. And that kind of catapulted me into a first kind of 15 minutes of fame. And, you know, one thing led to another thereafter. So I could keep going, but let me stop right there, David. You, I'll just talk the whole time. Well, no, no, we want you to talk because you, we're very interested in what you have to say. So at that point, you know, you, you got your dissertation, you were, you've done your PhD, you well established in, at least in people who were interested in thinking about policy, presumably not well liked. Were, were you ousted or did you, how did, how did your career move to that point? Well, it was a funny thing, David. You know, interestingly, I was at the Princeton University. I had a joint appointment in the politics department and what was then called the Woodrow Wilson School of Public International Affairs. And I was teaching law and society to undergraduates and law and public policy to master's students. Um, and interestingly, the people who were in charge of the politics department, Woodrow Wilson School, said, Ethan, like all this engagement in active public policy and writing, that's not going to help you for tenure. So <laughs> don't think that publishing, even though I look, I published not just in foreign policy. And so I published in science. I mean, a big piece in science in late 89, but they said, it's not going to help you for tenure. We're only going to evaluate you on your contribution to the field of political science, which I didn't particularly care about very much. But interestingly, at the senior university level, they were sort of supportive. They got a kick out of it. You know, they actually wanted me to go talk to alumni groups. So it was kind of mixed in that way. But meanwhile, there was nobody else at Princeton doing this kind of work, basically. And my first big grant, I created a group called the Princeton Working Group on the Future of Drug Use and Alternatives to Drug Prohibition. Um, I created that in 90s. I tried to think through and come up with a report about what would be the model drug control policy. And I pulled together all these people. None of them, uh, all of them were critical of the drug war. None of them were libertarian legalizers. It was all about trying to figure out how we go. And the group of people in it, I mean, Andy Weil was in it. Uh, Sasha Shulgin was in it. Lester Grinspoon was in it. A bunch of very prominent American academics, Craig Reinerman, Harry Levine, Marsha Rosenbaum, Paul Goldstein, Jeffrey Fagan, you know, you name it. I mean, really remarkable. I had the tobacco expert, Ken Warner from University of Michigan. I had a MacArthur Genius Award winning law professor from NYU, Sylvia Law. It was just an extraordinary group. So that became sort of part of my intellectual world. And at the same time, a couple guys in Washington, Arnold Treback, who was a professor at American University, and Kevin Zeese, who had briefly been the head of Normal, the American Mar Marijuana Legalization Group, had started an organization called the Drug Policy Foundation. And I got very, and they identified themselves as the loyal opposition to the war on drugs. In fact, their first meeting was actually in London in 87, but the real big meeting was really in DC in 88. And it was in that world that I began to meet other activists from the Europe, but also from the UK. I mean, I met Bing Spear at that first meeting in London in 87, who, you know, you will know, and some of your listeners, you know, was the guy working in the, I guess, the home office in, in London who was in charge of drug enforcement, but who like literally knew the names of every junkie in London, you know, personally and had a very modern, you know, harm reduction approach to dealing with things. So yeah, so you decided then the academic the path wasn't going to be as fulfilling as the uh, the change in the world path, yes. 
Well, I guess, I mean, really what happened was I'd begun thinking through, you know, what lies hereafter. I mean, to, I realized that there was a lot of very smart stuff that had been written about drugs and drug policy, but most of it was buried in the bowels of the library. There had been a real kind of intellectually interesting period in the 70s when Ford Foundation and others supported really innovative research. Harm reduction was really emerging without, but not being called harm reduction at that time. And then the 80s, it was like the dark ages descending and this stuff being buried buried in the libraries and no support from government for innovative research and the foundations were not into it. So I started thinking about what do I want to do here? Where do I want to be? And as I was thinking about this stuff in the summer of 92, I get a call out of the blue from some guy named George Soros, who at that point was not famous. I was going to say, know, did you know who it was? We don't, I don't know. I mean, you know what? I re recognized his name, David, because I remembered seeing a book of his, like on the remaindered shelves, the sales books in some bookstore, you know, back a few years earlier. And, you know, this was before the internet. And so I, you know, I kind of looked him up and people said, oh, yeah, he's a well known financier. He's been funding some stuff, to, you know, anti communism stuff in Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union, a little China, South Africa. And so I went with, so we had lunch. And it turned out by coincidence that Foreign Policy magazine, where I had written my first piece, by coincidence, the piece right next to mine was a piece by George Soros on Black Monday, the financial crash of 87. And I think also he had asked people like he was interested in this and who, you know, I was the most prominent figure in the U.S., you know, writing and speaking uh, about this stuff. So we had this two hour lunch on a day in the summer of 92. We hit it off. The end of that, he says to me, well, I see we basically agree on the key issues. We'll have our differences. Now, I'm a very busy man, but I have substantial resources. So let's assume I want to empower you to accomplish our common objectives. So I laughed, went home, wrote him up a proposal for funding me to create an interdis interdisciplinary center on drugs and drug policy and a grants program and supporting this drug policy foundation. And, you know, a few months later, he breaks the British bank. You know, he bets, you know, October 92, he bets against, you know, the British bank. He makes a billion or $2 billion in a couple of days. And all of a sudden he's on the front page of newspapers and he's become famous. And he starts to become an ever bigger philanthropist. And so we ultimately, you know, a year later we shook hands. And in 94, I left Princeton. He had asked me instead of creating my center within a university to do it within his newly emerging foundation called Open Society Institute back then. And that was the beginning of my days as really a full-time activist, you know, beginning in 94, first building up what I call the Lindesmith Center, named after Alfred Lindesmith, who was the first prominent American academic to challenge conventional thinking about drugs and drug policy. And then in 2000, spinning it out to create the Drug Policy Alliance, which is what I then built up over the next 17 years. Yes. Well, drug science, we had a small amount of money from the uh, Open Society Foundation, so we've all, we've all benefited, but that's quite a thrill to be given enough to set up your own institute. Well, more than that, David, you know, I mean, I really, in those, from 94 to 2000, it was a remarkable period because there was no other funding, essentially, for most drug policy reform or harm reduction. You know, I mean, George had the right instincts about what was wrong with the drug war. And part of it came from his instinct as a kind of businessman capitalist, seeing the absurdity of trying to, you know, control a dynamic, illicit market with criminal justice mechanisms. And part of it came from the human rights part of his consciousness and part of it came from the kind of evidence-based part of his consciousness and then I sort of taught him about harm reduction but at that point you know I mean essentially I was essentially the key gatekeeper for that funding so that meant getting not just stuff going in the U.S. both on stimulating the debate but also trying to advance things like needle exchange to reduce AIDS and trying to fight the stigma, stigma and methadone maintenance and moving forward the medical marijuana issue and beginning to address the, the mass incarceration. But it also meant tapping into Soros's international network and creating the International Harm Reduction Development Program in 1995, which over the, you know, over the last 25 years has provided hundreds of millions of dollars to advance harm reduction, first in the former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, and then really throughout the world. So it was really about funding the beginning stages of a political movement in the U.S. and also around the world. And, you know, sometimes when I look at some of the profiles that that had been written about me, like it was really very nice profile on Rolling Stone some years ago, but they focused mostly 
on the work I've done advancing marijuana reform in the U.S. because that was in some respects the most dramatic victory and it's, you know, the sexiest for the media. But, you know, for me, that was only really a portion of my work because one third of our work was about ending marijuana prohibition, you know, decriminalization, medical marijuana, ultimately legal regulation. But another third of our work was ending the role of the drug war in mass incarceration. And that meant taking on all the laws around cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine. It meant alternatives to incarceration. It meant all that stuff. So the last third of our work was really about making a very serious commitment to dealing with drugs and drug misuse. And the last third of our work was about making a serious commitment to dealing with drugs and drug misuse as a health issue, not a criminal issue, which meant harm reduction. It meant needle exchange, overdose prevention. It meant teaching Americans about European and other approaches to dealing with drugs in a less punitive way, all that sort of stuff. And those were, you know, the long haul efforts, but each of those areas of work got about one third of my attention and Drug Policy Alliance attention. And even though we were primarily focused on the US, I was deeply involved internationally, not just the International Harm Reduction Development Program, which I co-founded and co-chaired back in, you know, from the late 90s. But beyond that, the whole global drug policy effort, Mexico, Latin America, Europe. I mean, I landed up, you know, speaking not just in 40 states around the US, but 40 countries and around the world. It's sort of like what you've been doing, you know, testifying before parliaments and legislatures and giving speeches and engaging media. You know, when Uruguay got interested in legalizing marijuana, I sent my people down to Uruguay to give tutorials to all the key people working on this stuff. You know, in Mexico is about providing, you know, funding support for these things. You know, when New Zealand came up with this very innovative approach for dealing with synthetic cannabis about 10, 12 years ago, you know, some of the activists flew me in to talk to media and talk to politicians about that stuff. And for Soros, you know, I think I think people don't realize is that both for George and for me, we initially became interested in the drug issue from the global perspective, right? My first publication was in Foreign Policy magazine. George, When George would call me out of the blue, it was often because he wanted to talk about Mexico or Colombia or Afghanistan. You know, now I would be going in and pitching him, George, I need some more money from you so we can do these ballot initiatives in the U.S. on medical marijuana or marijuana legalization or treatment instead of incarceration or asset forfeiture reform or what have you. But I mean, that global international orientation was my origins and his as well. And it was one of our various bonds in all of this. Yeah, given the central role America has played in international policy, it was quite good to have Americans going out there trying to change things. You probably have more influence because you're an American than than if you hadn't been. Well, I mean, you think about it when I would go around and I would say, how can I help to people outside the U.S.? And they say, well, the first thing you can do is to try to change policy within the U.S. Because, I mean, look, the U.S., we really were the evil empire of the global war on drugs, you know, for roughly a century, really, from the, the first or second decade of the 20th century until basically the second term of Obama, you know, when Obama basically, you know, following the Colorado and Washington marijuana legalization victories, following his reelection, he begins to turn in a more progressive direction, at which point basically the Russians kind of seize the baton of global drug war, you know, proselytizer and, and grab it from us. But, you know, in that respect, I, I would oftentimes go to foreign countries and my first line would be, to apologize as an American citizen for the immense harm that we've done to other countries with our war on drugs, this proselytizing, this coercing, forcing countries to criminalize drugs they'd never even heard of because we had criminalized it, you know, to accept our law enforcement agents. And, you know, I mean, you looked at Latin America when Peru at one point, Colombia, Mexico, parts of the Caribbean, you know, some of these places almost becoming narco states, these governments being, you know, really squeezed between on the one hand, this dynamic global commodities market involving a commodity that was being exported or transported through their territory. And on the other hand, the U.S. with this relentless pressure and punitive approach saying, you better crack down, you better do what we want you to do, or we're going to hurt you, right? And so, I mean, that was it was an immensely destructive policy. But conversely, one of the things I take most pride in is that if you ask yourself the question, how did it happen? 
that in the midst of the U.S., the global champion of the war on drugs, of the hyperputed approach, of the mass incarceration approach, of the anti-science approach, how did it happen that we emerged as the global leader in legalizing and regulating cannabis? And I think that really stemmed from the fact that we began to pursue a very innovative strategy beginning in 1996 on legalizing medical marijuana through the ballot initiative process. You know, that political effort, which emerged be initially because of activists, and then I was able to step in and provide the money and expertise to turn a kind of grassroots activist effort into professional campaigns where we could actually change real laws. You know, that, that legalization of medical marijuana beginning in California 25 years ago in 1996, that helped to transform the broader dialogue around marijuana in our country. And it showed that the nascent drug policy reform movement in the U.S. could play ball in the major leagues of American politics. And I think that's why we had this almost bizarre thing where on the one hand, we keep being the global champion of the war on drugs and this hyperpunitive policy. But meanwhile, the medical marijuana thing is morphing into marijuana decrim is morphing into marijuana legalization. And that had to do with an innovative discipline strategy that we pursued in the U.S. And that really, I mean, if you look now, it's a bit sad, but also in some respects good. If you look in Latin America or Asia, even parts of Africa, and ask what are the most promising things happening on drug policy reform in those parts of the world, oftentimes the answer is the advance of medical marijuana. Right. I mean, you know, even in Africa, even in Asia and Latin America, I mean, even that, you know, that god awful president in the Philippines, Duterte going, hey, man, I like medical marijuana. Right. I mean, you know, Thailand legalizing medical marijuana, countries in Africa doing it. So I think we did something here that was really remarkable. And people think that what drove it was all the for-profit interests. But in fact, the for-profit interests played only a negligible role in the U.S. until roughly until after 2016. I mean, almost all the money I raised for this effort was not from people making money in the industry. It was from philanthropists who cared about this issue for the right reasons. So, yes, as a, you're very fortunate in the States in the, in the fact you are a United States. So each, the States did have do have some autonomy in relation to health care, which they don't have in terms of uh, drug policy. So they were able to, to use improvements in health care. Yeah, it was a little bit analogous. I mean, you saw some of that also in Switzerland and in Germany, where the cantons or the Lander, Lander could also pursue more innovative policies. So, you know, Zurich and Bern can move forward on, on heroin prescribing while Geneva or other, you know, more traditional areas were lagging behind. So, yeah, our federal system did offer, definitely offered some advantages in that regard, you know. And of course, you know, I mean, there's no doubt that it's easier to convince people that a drug is safe when it's a medicine <laughs> than when it's being used recreationally. Well, you know, I mean, this is where, David, I don't know if you noticed this, but you, you know, but the whole British system of physicians having the freedom to prescribe any drug that they felt was appropriate. And obviously the regulatory authorities, you know, clamped down on that over the years. But the fact that British doctors could prescribe pharmaceutical heroin, pharmaceutical cocaine, that you could have your Brompton's cocktails. I mean, that was really a very important role model. A, a very important book for me was one that uh, Arnold Treback, the American University professor who was the co-founder of Drug Policy Foundation, wrote called The Heroin Solution, describing sort of the British system. And I remember reading other books, you know, by Jerry uh, Stimson and Oppenheimer about that and other books about the, you know, these were formative books for me in a way written back in the early days. And interesting, people don't appreciate this. The same year that we did the Medical Marijuana Initiative in California in 1996, there was another ballot initiative in Arizona, which people incorrectly as sought was also a medical marijuana initiative. We saw it as an alternative to imprisoned treatment instead of incarceration initiative. But the principal driver behind it was a philanthropist named John Sperling. And he wanted to do something radical. And so what he wrote into what we wrote into that initiative was that it should include a provision authorizing a British type system in the US. So in it, it wrote that physicians should be allowed to prescribe any schedule one drug, heroin, cocaine, you know, LSD, you name it. Now, unfortunately, the way it was drafted meant that the provision could never be implemented. 
because the whole prescribing system in the U.S. is controlled by the federal government and thereby physicians could not legally write a prescription. So the state law could not be implemented. But it was a sort of radical principle of embracing the British approach, which was so important and remains so important um, in the U.S., but not being able to implement it. Well, of co- but of course, I mean, the British system got severely hammered when the Americans, back when we bought our Misuse of Drugs Act in 71, when we effectively, I think, I believe, although I can't prove it, due from pressure from the US, we basically stopped prescribing heroin. We, we effectively gave up that classic British approach because due to pressure from, uh, from you guys. Well, you know, it would be interesting because there's so much evidence of these. I mean, I, I shouldn't say evidence. I mean, I, I've heard endless anecdotes, and I'm certain that many of them are true about pressure, you know, in Europe, on the British, on the Dutch. I certainly, with respect to Australia, have reported threats that if Australia moved forward on various forms of drug policy reform, that the U.S. would become an opponent. You know, Australia is the major producer of listed opium coming from its uh, opi- opium fields in Tasmania, and they get an allocation under the U.N control system and the U.S. threatening to undermine that. I know when I would go down to Jamaica, I would hear all sorts of stories of how the U.S. was applying pressure there. I know it was true in Latin America. So I think that was clearly playing a key role. The other question I wonder about, though, is, you know, the other story I hear about the British system is that so long as most of the people getting the opioid and cocaine prescriptions from doctors were people who had been iatrogenically addicted by their physicians and were generally more middle class and, you know, functioning, that it all worked pretty well. But that part of what happened in the late 60s and 70s was you had this influx of heroin coming from, I don't know, Pakistan, Southwest Asia, what have you, and a rapidly growing number of people who are addicted to heroin who are using street sources and then going to the clinics or going to the physicians and looking for a legal prescription. And so it was a kind of different sort of clientele which my understanding was many doctors just didn't want to deal with. They felt like they were becoming more just kind of the intermediaries to a illicit drug supply. So the U.S. pressure supply played a role, probably so did, you know, that transformation in the population. Yes, I don't think we can attribute all failures in the world to America, but, but you have pressured us a lot. You, you even pressured us when I was uh, serving, before I was sacked and for my role as the drug star, you were even pressurizing us to, to ban cat. You know, I mean, it was kind of quite... Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. You Every year we would meet with the Foreign Office to talk about international drug policy. And every year they'd say, the Americans don't like this, our cat policy because they banned it and we haven't. Why don't we ban it? And I said, well, there's no point in banning it because it'll only make it more expensive and, and actually more sought after. Yeah, but the Americans want it. Well, that's fine. And eventually they did. Eventually when they sacked me, they then went on and banned cat. Yeah. Well, you know, you've had, it's interesting because, I mean, in your British policy, I remember meeting with Mo Molum at one point, right? She was a good supporter of reform, right? And, uh, you know, and some of your drugs are, some of them were pretty bad. Some of them were pretty good. I remember that, like Keith Helliwell, was that his name? You had some interesting characters, yes, the police you know, in, in there. No, I, I know, you know, we always kind of, I remember we'd be disappointed with your labor governments because we think, God, they should be good on this stuff. But then Tony Blair would sometimes sound worse than some of the conservatives. But then the conservatives would come in and they would sort of turn their back on their youthful libertarian sides and become drug warriors themselves you know so it's kind of a shame about how yes how slow the uk has proceeded we do have some remarkably hypocritical politicians you know we got a the second most powerful man in britain is a guy called gove michael gove and his parties his cocaine parties were infamous Uh you know until he became a minister and then then he kind of, you know, he sort of stopped doing them. But, he, you know, he's still, the legacy's there, the memories are there. And I find it very distressing. You know, he, he was Minister of Education, so he was sacking teachers uh-huh. who tested positive cocaine when everyone knew he had a terrible cocaine. Yeah. Well, not habit, but certainly he was, a, he was a great user. Well, you know, I also remember there was a moment when the conservative was a home secretary or a shadow secretary, with Ann Whittacombe speaks up at some conservative party conference and starts doing some anti-marijuana rap. And she supposedly starts getting mocked from the audience. And I say, okay, here's some positive hope, some reason for change. But in point of fact, 
you know, it, it just didn't go anywhere. I mean, I mean, it seems to me what's been innovative in the UK is when you have these like local police chiefs who are basically moving things in the right direction. Remember, I mean, John Marks was the physician up in Merseyside, right, who got all the attention back in the 90s. But meanwhile, you know, who was prescribing heroin. But I remember there were a half dozen other physicians, a fellow named Jeffrey Marks and a range of others who were who were doing this stuff. You know, so there were always innovative leaders, either in medicine or in, you know, in medicine or in law enforcement who were trying to do the right thing. But it's been, you know, it's been tough going at the national level. Hello, Drug Science Podcast listeners. I wanted to quickly tell you about an event we're hosting on the 9th and 10th of April, 2022. And this is the second Drug Science Student Psychedelic Conference. The last one was an enormous success, not least because, of course, it's the most inexpensive psychedelic conference in the world, with tickets as low as £5 for a two-day online conference. And during the conference, we're going to cover a whole range of different topics, music, philosophy, relationships, and much more. And you can find the tickets in the show notes for this episode and on the Drug Science website. And I look forward to meeting you all again at the conference. And now, back to the show. Well, you know, this, the rumor about John Marks is that it was going very well. He was prescribing a heroin up in Liverpool. And then Reagan and Thatcher met. I've been told that Reagan said to Margaret Thatcher, we don't like this, this doctor prescribing heroin. That's a very bad thing. It's encouraging ah. others to use it. And she came back and she stopped it. Is that right? And then John, uh, John retired to... New Zealand. And in fact, um, the day after I was sacked or two days after, he sent me an email saying, David, you can join me. <laughs> you know, you can join me on the on, on the beach here. If you oh, want. my. They're very well. Yeah. Yeah, really, David. But like I tell you, when you were in that position for a little while, it was such a breath of fresh air because, you know, here you have the pivotal person, the British government on drug policy, putting out this radically empirically based stuff, pointing out that in point of fact, alcohol and tobacco are really in many respects the two most dangerous drugs we know and being just, I mean, just speaking common sense and science. And you realize that the tolerance for that, you know, was so de minimis. I mean, I'll tell you, there've been other people, you know, I remember in the early days, David, in, in the late 80s, in the first, you know, when as drug policy reform was first gaining some recognition and some momentum in global circles, there was a Dutch drug czar named Eddie Engelsman, right? And I would loved about Eddie Engelsman, who was the Dutch drug czar, was he, he, on the one hand, he had to be careful about being identified with any legalization stuff, but he was showing up at these events and saying, I, look, I can't endorse this legalization talk. But as the lead drug control official in the Netherlands, I want to know that the Netherlands is sympathetic to the advances of this movement. And we admire the embrace of harm reduction. And he showed up at the, the first International Anti-Prohibitionist Congress in Rome in 1989. He showed up at other gatherings. And so you have occasionally these, you know, brave officials. There was a guy in Peru, Ricardo Soberon who was briefly the drug czar until he got pushed out under, I think, U.S. pressure. And he may, in fact, be coming back again. So, you know, we oftentimes depend upon these, you know, or, or who in Latin America 10 years ago, all, all of a sudden, you know, this left-wing former guerrilla, you know, Mujica, president of Uruguay, says, let's legalize marijuana. Or in Guatemala, this former right-wing military general, Otto Perez Molina, says, let's talk about legalizing drugs writ large. And, you know, and basically, I think, all doing it for the right reasons. You know, President Santos in Colombia, you know, the former president, once again, speaking out. And it's sometimes it's that kind of bold leadership you see, either from people who are in the position that you are in as effective, you know, drugs are, or at our more senior political positions who have the intellectual honesty and the guts to step out. And I've almost never seen somebody do that for the wrong reason, simply because there are political costs to doing it for the right reason. And you have to believe in it if you're going to do it. Yeah, so what you, what's your take? Is the American anti-drug, was it all political or do you think it's part of the American puritanical, you know, the, the children of the Mayflower, or do you think it's partly driven by the drinks industry wanting to control? I mean, well, what, 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 what's your analysis now of what the drivers for this are? Because it, it has been enormous. I mean, it is a lot of things, right? The first thing I remind Americans is I say, don't forget 
that we were the, one of the only countries in the Western world to prohibit alcohol and not just to prohibit it, but to pass a national amendment, which is, you know, we don't, we've only amended our constitution less than three dozen times in over 200 years. So we don't, it doesn't happen simply or easily, but we actually amended our constitution in order to ban alcohol. And it then became also the only amendment in the history of our country to be repealed by a subsequent amendment, the, the 18th being repealed by the 21st. So that kind of puritanical sentiment, that belief that we need to put our our, our moral views into our criminal laws that to give them more power, that proselytizing dimension, you know, that this almost, you know, religious element that my body is God's sacred vessel and I have an obligation to my Lord and maker to keep this body pure and free. So that's always been an element. It's why, you know, this abstinence only ideology is, remains so strong in the U.S. and why harm reduction has had a harder time getting real traction here in the U.S. and in many other countries. You know, in a way, it's, it's almost like we had that Scandinavian thing, that Swedish thing, right? This, this great fearfulness around psychoactive substances, even including alcohol in our history. I mean, if you look at what people said about alcohol 100 years ago, it was verbatim what they were saying about crack cocaine or methamphetamine in more recent years. So that's one piece. A second piece is the connection with race and ethnicity. You know, the anti-Chinese sentiment, you know, was part of what drove our first opium prohibition laws. And mind you, not just in the U.S., but there was elements of that in Australia and Canada and maybe U.K. Anti-cocaine laws, right, were about, you know, anti-black racism. Anti-marijuana laws were about fears around Mexicans, Americans and Mexican migrants. Um, you know, even alcohol prohibition was to some extent a kind of broader social conflict between the white, white Americans who had come from Northern and Western Europe in the 18th and early 19th century, and then not so white, white Americans coming from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe in the late 19th and, and early 20th centuries, right? So that element has always played a large role. And then I think you go beyond, beyond the race issue and the kind of absolute puritanical religious-based sentiment. I mean, there have been key players. Like if you look in the late 80s, one of the major drivers of the drug war was an organization called the Partnership for a Drug-Free America, which at that point in its early years was taking money from big alcohol, big tobacco, and big pharma. They finally got humiliated into not taking any money from big alcohol, big tobacco. But the head of that organization, was a guy named Jim Burke, who was simultaneously the chairman of the board of Johnson & Johnson, one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies, and one of the most respected and admired business people in America, right? And, you know, for them, if you like today do a Google search on the word drug, what pops up is both all the pharmaceuticals as well as all the illicits. So they had a marketing issue. How do we distinguish our good drugs from those bad drugs? And the partial for Drug-Free America, part of its mission was to keep everybody's attention focused on marijuana and kids and away from all the pharmaceuticals were oftentimes causing far greater problems. So you had that element. And then of course, a very, very powerful law enforcement industry, a drug prohibition you know, enforcement industrial complex. Right, uh, you know the, the the criminal justice industrial complex, where political where prosecutors and law enforcement officials become immensely powerful, you know, and they really drive a hyper punitive approach. They're not interested in health approaches, so they play a hugely important role in driving the drug war in the late '80s, early '90s, and obviously, you know, Republican politicians, you know, wanting to. Uh, gain as much political advantage as they can by playing off people's fears around drugs and kids and black people and crime. And the Democrats being afraid of being accused of being soft on all those things back in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. So you put it all together and it was a toxic mix, which resulted in the U.S., you know, with barely 4% of the world's population having over 20% of the world's incarcerated population and the drug war being the major driving force behind that in the 80s and the 90s and the aughts. Less of a role today, but a very powerful role back then. And are people accepting now that they got it wrong? Or is that, well, is that still you know, a battle to <laughs> You know, it's an interesting thing about people saying they got it wrong. I mean, you know, what happens is oftentimes there are a small number of people who think about it and realize, oh God, we got it wrong, we got to change it. And then there's a much larger number of people who basically just change without really thinking about it. You think about the evolution of public opinion around homosexuality and gay rights and gay marriage. 
right? And there are thoughtful people who switch about it. But I think what happens is sometimes people find their views changing just because the zeitgeist is changing, just because of what's accepted is changing, all this sort of stuff. And so, so I think, you know, what happened, I mean, look, part of it, of course, is our advocacy efforts. I mean, we devoted, you know, huge amounts of time and people hours and money to really shifting the debate around marijuana, around mass incarceration, around the drug war, around harm reduction, around how we deal with these things. And this, this continuing process of educating, educating, spreading the word, being disciplined about the language. I mean, that helps move people along relatively few politicians ever admit they were wrong. You know, I mean, I mean, one of the things I admire about Bill Clinton is he was terrible on drug policy when he was president. But at least since he was up there, he said, I was wrong. I was wrong. I should have supported needle exchange to reduce AIDS. I should have supported medical marijuana. I should not have supported mass incarceration. And people say, well, why didn't you do the right thing when you were president? And that's a legitimate criticism. But I think even his apologizing is, it's an honest thing to do. I, I see very few, I never really heard Jesse Jackson, you know, the prominent black leader in America in the late 20th century, or Charlie Rangel, the most influential black member of Congress on drug policy. I've never really heard them apologize for the drug war. You know, I had Senator Schumer, the New York state senator, who's now the majority leader of the U.S. Senate who's now supporting a marijuana legalization bill, a very progressive one. And I, kind of, I had him on my podcast a few months ago and I challenged him and he said, well, Ethan, times change. You know, so, I mean, politicians, you know, it's not about always saying what's true or right or what they actually believe. It's about trying to make political change in the ways you believe in and picking your spots in your times, right? Yes, quite well. Yeah, that's why we're not politicians because it's yeah, it takes a very considerably different sort of mentality to be able to live with that kind of ambiguity. I mean, it really is. You know, a lot of times people would ask me if I wanted to go into politics or run for office, and I would say, why? I mean, first of all, I think I was having more impact by mobilizing resources to change drug laws. Secondly, I got to basically say what I believed. I mean, I had to pull my punches only where it was necessary to be politic in certain ways. But by and large, you know, I was out there saying what I believe and what I knew to be true based upon the science, what I knew based to be true upon my basic set of human rights values. And the other thing, of course, that you and I know is it's nice to be out there when we're the experts i mean you and i have devoted our lives to studying this stuff we know what we're talking about and so when we go out there if we're in a debate the chance that somebody's going to beat us is pretty damn slim we're going to have the edge whereas if you're a politician you're dealing with dozens of issues you're always skating on thin ice you're dependent upon what not just your electorate says but also the loudest mouths say and also in our country what the money says you know and so, you know, that all seems like forms of like infringing on my freedom to be an advocate for what I believe in. So, I mean, I really believe, and I, I imagine you feel the same way that notwithstanding having been sacked by the government, that, you know, we're in this incredibly, you know, desirable situation of being able to spend our lives fighting for and speaking in of what we believe to be true and what oftentimes we know to be true. What a great position. We are no, absolutely. It is a privilege to be in that position. Not, you know, to uh, you may get assaulted and insulted by the press or by politicians, but as you say, your conscience is right, and you are telling people the truth. And that it's much harder. Than that. I mean, David, you know what I remember is like the time that you and I spent the most time together is when we went down to that drug policy reform conference in South Africa. And we were in first Cape Town for a, a broader drug reform conference and then in Johannesburg on a marijuana thing. But, you know, I, and you and I were on all these panels together and doing this media together. And I remember it was just so much fun because here we are here in South Africa. You know, it was kind of more, you know, virgin territory for this stuff. There were some good activists, Sean Shelley, who had organized these conferences and a range of others. But, you know, the pleasure of just educating people and, and turning people's minds around, you know, and I remember, I would just remember having so much fun with you kind of playing off the audience and of one another and engaging people on, you know, opening their eyes on this sort of stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> What could be better? You know, people sometimes ask me, do I miss teaching? Do I miss being a professor? And I feel like I'm still a pro I mean, even in creating Drug Policy Alliance, it was just speaking to a broader audience, it's teaching to a broader group, whether it's the people who were working my organization or the people out there. And that's actually the nice thing about doing these podcasts as well. It's a way to continue in this work. 
No, absolutely. There's no doubt. And it's just the, the future way, of course, isn't it? Especially with COVID, <laughs> you can reach a lot. The chances of going back to South Africa in the next few years are pretty slight, but we can, they can listen to I us. I know. I know. It, it is sad. It is sad. Although, although it was nice to get to London a few months ago when there was this lull in COVID and to show up at one of your drug science events at the House of Lords and see a few hundred people gather there and seeing a, a few old familiar faces, but a whole bunch of new, pa new, new faces. And I actually met a couple of members of parliament, one a conservative, one labor, who were leading champions of drug policy reform at your event. So it, it was nice to see the sort of community that exists there and that you've helped create with, with you know, with, with drug science no it's you know I, i'm pleased i'm quite proud of what we've done okay again you know we have to uh, accept it was a philanthropist that kicked it off not someone quite as much as saw us but there aren't many people who are well i think you've also you struggled a bit because you know we have that tradition of philanthropy in the u.s which to some extent is grounded in our tax structure and the benefits that come from you know the, to the wealthy by giving away money in that way but i know that trying to raise money outside the u.s i i think of, for drug policy alliance i once raised a major contribution from a prominent nexus mexican businessman but we never had any other success in latin america i remember in the uk you know you look at the good work i mean i think between your organization and beckley foundation and transform and release there have been donors but you haven't been blessed with the sorts of donors or the, that funding community that we have here and it's even harder you know in, in other countries there's a little bit of that maybe in switzerland but you just don't have the same tradition people tend to look to government obviously the eu has been a source of funding for some good reform-based efforts and organizations and we don't ha really have that option in the u.s but i have to say you know i mean for me you know i sometimes think one of probably the one among the biggest challenges I confronted was really about building this funding base. And it was from people across the political spectrum, you know, people who agreed on nothing oftentimes except drug policy. You know, uh, Soros, who was became increasingly went from being more of the center to more of the left over the years I knew him. But then people on the on the right wing side, some libertarians, some not, you know, and they would disagree about agree about almost everything but this. And I found myself instead of like using my intellectual energies to write articles for publication in scientific or policy journals, I found that now my intellectual energies were devoted to writing letters, fundraising letters to very prominent billionaires to try to get them to give the money to fuel the movement. And that's where I would put my creative writing, you know, stuff into. But in a way that I think that transition was necessary in order to mobilize the resources. Yeah, well, you, looking back over the last 30 years, you, know, you must be very proud of what you've achieved. And I mean, I guess, how do you see the next 10? Are we going to get people out of prison for cannabis offenses? Are we going to have it made legal under the federal law? What, 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 how do you see the next 10 years panning out? Well, I think the cannabis thing is really unstoppable now. I mean, there will be, and there, you know, there's going to be continued efforts to try to handicap it and cripple it. And people will put focus on the excesses and they'll bring up the kids issue. Some of the issues will be legitimate, but the approaches that they pursue will mostly be illegitimate. But I think, you know, we have cannabis is now legal in well over a third of the country. It's 18 or 19 states, you know, for for adult use and it's, you know, 38 states or something like that for medical use. So I think it's, you know, we're on our way. New York just legalized uh, last year. New Jersey just did. You know, some of the big states like Texas and Florida, I think it's only a, a matter of time. And so we're going to get to a point where it's legal more or less around the country where, you know, as with the repeal of alcohol prohibition, I think Mississippi did not legalize alcohol for decades after the repeal of alcohol prohibition. So you, you oh, may really? have some localities that retain their local prohibitions, either at the municipal level or state level. And when it comes to federal legalization, that'll simplify things. But a lot of advocates of marijuana legalization are a little wary of that because once it's fully legal at the federal level, that means there's no obstacles to big alcohol, tobacco, and big pharma coming into this thing. And so there's a whole range of people saying, let's not move too fast. Like, at least the Fed should allow marijuana businesses to to use regular federally regulated banks that would be a good thing it would be good from a public safety issue you wouldn't have cash lying around you know people are saying let's deal let's allow businesses to marijuana businesses to take a tax deduction for ordinary business expenses the way other businesses do so there are things on the business side that may happen and I think some of the uh, reparative way element of kind of, you know, we've seen this evolution last half dozen years where 
you know, before, if you want to suggest that people who had been convicted of a drug offense should be allowed to participate in the marijuana business, that was seen as a loser at the polls. Now that's increasingly seen as, seen as a winner, especially as we pursue reform through the legislative process rather than the ballot initiative process. So I think marijuana is on its way and it's going to spread, you know, what just happened in Germany where the new German government has said it wants to legalize. That's going to take some years to happen if it actually does, but it's moving. Malta just legalized. Luxembourg's about to do it. Italy will have a referendum. We'll see what happens there. So Europe's moving forward. Latin America, Mexico is kind of keeps tripping over itself, but it says it's going to legalize. Canada has got a dynamic thing going. So I think marijuana legalization is going to spread around the world. And I think that's going to be unstoppable in many parts. I've been at the same time, as I'm sure you have, David, amazed at the advance with the psychedelic stuff. Yes. I was going to ask you about mushrooms in Oregon now. So on you go. I mean, that initiative in Oregon, and now you look at, you know, other states trying to do that. And then with the, the medical side of the thing and the research side, and I can claim very little role in that. I mean, I, you know, I've always been personally fascinated and psychedelics have played an important role in my own personal life. But, but I was never all that involved on the kind of active advocacy in that area. And so you and I were just at this conference in Miami in November on psychedelics, business and medicine. And then there was another one in December. And I'm blown away at what's going on on that front. And I think that that stuff, both on the decriminalization side through the political angle, as well as on the medical side that's going on, you know, with all the research and with MDMA about to be approved by the FDA in a few years and psilocybin, that, you know, all the issues around commercialization, which are incredibly complicated and are, you know, double-edged in the sense that they're providing the pivotal funding for all the research. At the same time, they're trying to patent things in ways that will keep costs high and create problems. So I think that's remarkable. I think we're also moving in the direction, certainly in the U.S., you know, Oregon back in 2020 had the initiative about legally regulating, decriminalizing psilocybin and setting up, allowing the state to regulate clinics. But they had another ballot initiative, which my organization, Drug Policy Alliance, was the key driving force behind, led by my successors. And that was all drug decrim. That was introducing the Portugal model into the U.S. And both those initiatives passed by about the same margin, I think 56 percent of the vote or something like that. And so that notion of ending the criminalization of simple drug use and possession for people who are not involved in engaging in crimes that hurt other people, you know, that's a model that the Portuguese did. It's common in other parts of Europe to some extent. Uruguay did it. People didn't even realize that Uruguay was a, a leader in that as well. But I think, I think we're going to see more of that about just no longer putting people behind jail simply for drug possession, so long as they're not getting behind the wheel of a car or hurting other people. I think we're going to see also more and more ending of these mandatory minimum sentences where people, you know, engaged in low-level drug offenses get sentenced to dozens of years behind bars as if they were a rapist or murder. I think that's going to fade. I think we're going to see more and more health control of health-minded people in control of drug agencies. But when it comes to you know, the bigger issue about are we, I mean, look, the really $64,000 question now is in the U.S. around fentanyl, because here you have an opioid, you know, we have 100,000 overdose fatalities, you know, in the last year, and for all sorts of reasons. And whereas before, you know, most overdose fatalities in earlier years typically involved combining heroin or a pharmaceutical opioid with alcohol or benzos, right? It was, they were called heroin overdoses, but in fact, they were fatal drug combinations. But with fentanyl, you don't need a third party, a second party. Straight out fentanyl, you know, and that stuff's getting mixed into cocaine and amphetamine for reasons that nobody even understands. And so when you have an illicit drug and when supply control strategies, there, there is no effective supply control strategy for fentanyl. There's no way to stop it from coming from China or Mexico. They're coming in little packages that can, you know, get tens of thousands of people high or dead. So that's forcing a rethinking and we're slow in the U.S. to do it. But when I look at the discussion in British Columbia around safe supply, right, of a government saying, you know, if people are committed to getting this drug one way or another, and they're going to go to the illicit market and they're going to use fentanyl, which is highly risky, you know, let's at least find a way to allow at least that part of the population to get the drugs they want from legally regulated sources 
And let's try to figure out a way where people are already using these drugs can get it from a regulated source without threatening the broader public health. I mean, I think that's the $64,000 question on the horizon around where we go with drug regulation more broadly. Well, we've not got very long. I want to, but I need to get, move you out because you've you've left the Drug Policy Alliance, which was a surprise to all of us, and you've now moved. You're in championing tobacco harm reduction. I think. Do you want to just finish off by telling us why you did that? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I tell you, in terms of when I left EPA in 2017, I mean, I actually planned that over a couple of years. I could see everything from the personal to the organizational political. It was coming to a particular moment where it said, Ethan, it's time to step aside. I've been going nonstop between Linda Smith Center and Drug Policy Alliance 23 years, round the clock. And, you know, I built a strong organization. So it felt, and I had not a single regret about my timing or how I did it or what have you. So I feel good about that. But the issue around tobacco harm reduction, David, I'm so delighted that you're in it, involved in it as well. You know, I've been paying attention to the issue for 20 years and harm reduction seemed to make as sense for tobacco as it did for the illicit drugs. And then you have in more recent years, this kind of technological breakthroughs with the e-cigarette and with Juul and with the heat not burn devices, you know, the ICOs and things like that. And then you have, you know, SNUS coming out of Sweden, but then you have new versions of SNUS, you know, the pouches that you put in your lips and what have you. And you look at the evidence, you know, published in the top journals. And what it clearly shows is that A, that these devices seem to be more effective in helping people quit smoke cigarettes than anything else out there. The only potential contender may be something like mush magic mushrooms. And I'm glad that finally the US government is funding a study on smoking cessation and you know using psilocybin. So we'll see where that goes in the future. But at this point, these tobacco harm reduction devices are absolutely crucial. I mean, to the point that if you could snap your fingers and all of the billion plus smokers in the world were tomorrow to stop smoking and to switch entirely to e-cigarettes or heat not burn devices or snusses or whatever these things are, it would be one of the greatest advances in public health in global history. But most people don't know that. And meanwhile, in the U.S., people started to freak out about all these teenagers juuling using these e-cigarettes. And nobody wants kids doing that stuff. But we know that some of those kids have been smoking. We know some of those kids who had not been smoking, you know, they get into it, but most are not getting addicted. And although we don't have the hard evidence to prove it, it does appear that even being a lifelong consumer of e-cigarettes, right, is probably dramatically less dangerous than smoking cigarettes. So the fact of the matter is the harm reduction benefits of getting adult smokers who can't quit to switch to tobacco harm reduction products makes a huge amount of sense from a public health approach, even if young people begin doing e-cigarettes, some of whom will continue doing with it. But, you know, uh, you know, one of my lines oftentimes for decades has been that the war on drugs is typically justified as one great big child protection act. And that's what we're seeing here with the opposition of tobacco harm reduction. You know, it's all about the kids. There's essentially an underlying mentality that says, give me a choice between saving the lives of 10 adult smokers by getting them to switch or one young person taking up vaping an e-cigarette. Hey, more important to deter that one young person from taking up an e-cigarette than to save the lives of those 10 smokers. And that mentality is what drove the original drug war. So I'm interested in this issue, A, because the evidence is overwhelmingly in favor of tobacco harm reduction, but B, because I'm concerned that in fact, we're going to see the growing criminalization of tobacco and nicotine. And that I can easily see 10, 20 years from now, a new drug war emerging involving the criminalization of tobacco products. And I actually think you know, that even with the tobacco harm reduction movement, there's a split between those who say, once we get levels of smoking low enough, let's criminalize cigarettes. And those who say, never criminalize cigarettes, because that's just going to create another black market and another, you know, so I'm on the view that says, do everything we can to get people to switch through higher taxation and incentives and all this sort of stuff, you know, to switch to these less dangerous devices, but don't criminalize actual cigarettes because don't forget 
The whole global war on drugs involves barely 1% of the, or 2% of the global population using heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, you know, and, you know, inevitably people are going to keep smoking cigarettes. You know, I do not want to go to my deathbed having, you know, patting myself on the back for my role in legalizing marijuana and rolling back the border drug war. And meanwhile, seeing a whole new drug war starting up involving tobacco products. That would be a major disappointment. Well, if anyone's going to stop that happening, it's going to be you, Ethan, and uh, include me in if you can. All right. <laughs> well, David, it's an honor to do this with you. I have such massive admiration for who you are, what you're doing, the way you step out, the way you speak truth to the powerful, truth to everybody else, and, and your relentless energy. And I see your name on publications in every possible area in this area. So you're doing it all. God bless you. Keep going, keep going, keep going for dozens more years because, I mean, you know, we, we need you in there. We sure do. I will do my best and have no doubt you'll succeed as well. Ethan, great pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I look forward to being on your podcast and sharing some more of my insights at some point. I look forward to that too, David. Thank you. That'll be great. Okay, man. Take care and best wishes for the new year. And you. Thanks.